Hello, everyone. My name is Bill Joyce. I'm the chair of the Pasadena Group. We'd like to get started right on time tonight because we've got a whole lot to show you tonight. Uh, this is a Pasadena Group program for September, and um, glad you could join us. Our featured speakers tonight are Peter Eisenstadt and Dr. Michael Warner, and they will give a presentation on the I'm, these are just on, on the sky as seen in the infrared with the Spitzer Space Telescope and with the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, you'll hear more about Dr. Warner and Peter Eisenhart uh, a little bit later, but I just want to mention that they co authored a book entitled More Things in the Heavens How Infrared Astronomy is Expanding Our View of the Universe, a Sweeping Tour of the Infrared Universe as Seen Through the Eyes of NASA's Spacer, Space, Spitzer Space Telescope. Okay, um, So we also have a, a, a sort of a special event to add to our featured talk this evening. And this is the big news. Mr. Reggie Wilkins has volunteered to set up his telescope in the parking lot. And at the conclusion of the talk, we're all invited to get a close-up look at the night sky through the telescope. So. Um, that's going to come up a little bit later this evening. Don't run for your cars. You want to get it. <laughs> run, run, for, run, run for Mr. Wilkins and his telescope. Uh, before we start tonight, um, I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about membership because our, our Sierra Club is trying to promote membership. Uh, it's good for the Sierra Club and it's good for the Pasadena group. To begin with, um, if I may, I'd like to ask you to, you know, how did you find out about the meeting tonight? Did How many of you, if you could just raise your hands, uh, found out about it by reading about the meeting in our newsletter, the Arroyo View, which is online. It's an online newsletter. OK. Um, anybody here from uh, one of the astronomy groups? We reached out to some astronomy groups in the San Gabriel Valley, and we invited them to come. OK. Um, what about uh, just uh, through the chapter website, maybe, or you saw it in a newspaper somewhere? Uh, Meetup. Meetup, okay. Thank you for bringing that up. Anybody else from Meetup? Oh, okay. A load of that. Meetup. Okay. Hmm? So, Meetup, yeah. No, no. That's it. How, did you, how did you hear about it? How about how about the? Uh, oh, I'm a member. oh, okay. Yeah, Roy of you, or yeah. the, email. the one of the emails. The emails. You look familiar. I think you were at our um, our dinner last December. Yes, I was. Uh, I'm, it's good to see you again. Thank you. Um, and I'm a big supporter of the Pasadena chapter. Yes, you are. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. Okay, uh, so uh, membership. So. Uh, I personally, I personally am proud that we've always, um, the Sierra Club's free at all the events and all of the hikes and things that they're always uh, open to everyone. You don't need to be a member in order to participate. And um, if for whatever reason you want to delay your membership, you know, that's okay. It's up to you. But we're glad to have you on board, you know, coming out hiking with us or coming to these meetings. But um, the membership matters because when you sign up to become a member, particularly if you sign up through our Pasadena Group website, you should know that 100% of your membership fee stays right here in Pasadena. And that happens when you sign up through our website. If you, uh, if you do it else, if you do it through another way, if you maybe go for a hike with one of the other groups in the Angeles chapter and you sign up just you know, through them, then your membership goes to Oakland the National Sierra Club, and that's okay too, but it's better if it's, as far as we're concerned, it's better if it stays right here in Pasadena. Um, we use your membership fee to pay for the auditorium that we have to rent so we can continue to do these meetings, and uh, that really helps us. So membership is $15 a year for new members, and um, we try to make it as easy as we can. Uh, we have a QR code on the back table, and if you just take a picture of the QR code, you can use that to get to our website directly. 
And again, through the website is how you sign up so that your membership fee stays with us here in Pasadena. So I really wanted to you know, let you know about that. It's kind of important. We do uh, all we can to remain active here in the Pasadena Group area and stay engaged with our community. Uh, another thing we do is hikes, 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 outings, hikes, hikes. We like to go hiking. And so uh, I'm going to invite Pam Allen, one of our co-outings chair up here, and she's going to talk to you about upcoming outings with the Pasadena Group. Pam? that I'm going to mention are not quite as far as what we're going to be speaking about today, which is several million light years in distance. So I'm talking about hikes that are anywhere from, say, 5 to 20 miles, and most of them on a day. Most of them on the occasion are not even 20 miles a day. So that's, um, but I'm going to mention a few of them. They are in the, um, the schedule of activities from Sierra Club, which you can access whether or not you are a member of Sierra Club. So you can find out what hikes there might be available, but you can find out um, our specific ones. I think I call our flagship um, hikes is the Thursday night um, Henninger conditioning hikes, um, which are, you know, very local and they're, what is it, five miles in each direction and you go up for an hour and then you turn around and come back. It's five miles old. Five miles old. <laughs> sorry, sorry, no, no. Obviously. I've been on a long hike today, so if I make a mistake, I, I, I'm hardly here at all. We've got, so those are every Thursday night. And Eric, who is our video person, is the mover and shaker on that. We've got several other of the leaders from the, Sierra, uh, from the Henninger hikes um, here tonight. So those are a good way to just get some exercising done and be part of the group. Um, Coming up um, in the uh, Saturday, September the 18th, I and Greg Coleman, is he here? Yes, over there. We're riding a hike up to Dawn Mine. Dawn Mine being a place that's, well, it's not a mine anymore, and sometimes it's hard to find. Um, but it's going to be an interesting one. It's something I've done over, ye over the years for a number of times. Um, and then this, uh, all, almost all our hikes, with the exception of the Thursday night hikes, are on Saturdays, um, so that it makes it sort of convenient, or more convenient for people who are, um, you know, working a regular Monday through Friday uh, work situation. Um, then we've got one in September, the end of September, which is our uh, the five tallest peaks here in the San, in the San Gabriel area, say uh, San Gabriel, Disappointment, Deception, Martin, and Mount Walk. So that's that's one of our more strenuous hikes, which has got, well, I can't remember what the distance is, but um, it, it'll keep you busy. Um, and, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, then on October the 28th, we've got a trip to Mount Wilson via the toll road which is going to be a long distance and it'll certainly keep you in shape. You can enjoy your ice cream afterwards for that one. Um, and then we said that you had a hike on every Thursday for the Henninger hikes, except one in the next two months. Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. We're not having one on Thursday night for on Thanksgiving Thursday night. However, there's going to be a hike on Thursday morning to get you so you can earn your Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> so that's that's one. And, um, you know, our where are you, David, is our, our main mover and shaker on that one. Um, and then we've got programs coming up on the first Wednesday of next month, which is the first of October. No. Uh, the 4th of October, um, about Northeast trees and bringing nature back. And then we've got another one on climate ethics on the 1st of November. So we've got several different programs. I've got a few handouts, but I think most people can probably access this thing better 
uh, through the Sierra Club bo um, website. But it's not that I don't want to give them out, but I don't like to throw paper away. Um, so I think I will let, turn it back to Bill and we can talk about billions of light years. Pam reminded me of something. Uh, we're being videotaped tonight. Uh, Greg, um, Eric is, is videotaping the show, so um, that's going on. And now, uh, oh, George Vine, our co programs chair, is going to introduce our speakers. George? Thanks, Bill. You are in for a treat tonight. We have two JPL astronomers who will present the old, the cold, and the dirty. Infrared astronomy explores the universe. Infrared investigations are at the heart of much of contemporary astrophysical exploration. In the infrared, we study objects which are old, distant objects whose light comes to us from billions of years ago, stretched into the infrared by the cosmic expansion. Cold, with temperatures less than a few thousand degrees, which radiate much more copiously in the infrared than visible light, and dirty, the as the cosmic dust which permeates galaxies can conceal objects from view in the ultraviolet and optical bands while becoming transparent in the infrared. Dr. Michael Werner was the project scientist for the Spitzer Space Telescope and also served the, as the chief scientist for astronomy and physics at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, California Institute of Technology. He has been an active researcher in infrared astronomy for over 50 years, studying star formation, the interstellar medium, central regions of our galaxy, and exoplanets. He has served as Spitzer Project Scientist since 1983 and was one of the leaders of the evolution of Spitzer from a shuttle attached payload into the elegant free flying observatory, which operated successfully in an Earth trailing orbit, solar orbit for over 16 years. Werner was named the 2006 George Darwin Lecturer by the Royal Astronomical Society in recognition of the success of Spitzer and is also the recipient of two NASA Outstanding Leadership Medals and um, the NASA Distinguished Public Service Medal. He graduated from Haverford College in 1963 with a BA in Physics and received a PhD in Astronomy from Cornell in 1968. He is now an active member of the Sphere X team, working on JPL's newest uh, astrophysics mission, which will obtain spectra in the infrared of the entire sky. Uh, Dr. P Peter Eisenhart is also a JPL astronomer, and spent a large part of his career on the Spitzer mission. He is currently a senior research scientist and a project scientist for the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer at JPL. He has been awarded the NASA Exceptional uh, Achievement Medal, the NASA Exceptional Service Medal, and the JPL Edward Stone Award for Outstanding Research Publication. Peter got his PhD in Physics and Astronomy from the University of Pennsylvania and his PhD in Astronomy from the University of Arizona. Uh, we would ask that you please hold your questions until the end of the presentation. Well, there'll be lots of time for questions and answers and then. We just want to make sure that these gentlemen can get through their presentation in the time that we have allotted. Uh, won't you please join me in welcoming Michael and Peter to the club. Great. Okay, well, thank you all for coming and to hear Peter and uh, myself talk about our favorite topic, which is the Spitzer's Hayes Telescope and now the James Webb Space Telescope with its worthy successor. You can see on the left the Spitzer Space Telescope getting ready for launch. It operated from 2003 to 2020, and you notice the people there for scale. Now over here is the James Webb Space Telescope, which launched in 2021, and we anticipate going at least as long as Spitzer, so we put the lifetime as 17 years as it was for Spitzer, 
you notice the people in this image who look like Lilliputians. Well, those are the same size as the people in the other image, just that the telescope has gotten a lot bigger. And although the results from, from James Webb are only starting to come in, it's going to be a fantastic uh, scientific mission successor both to Spitzer and to the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, we start out by uh, our book uh, that was mentioned. We have a couple of copies in the back and also some Spitzer swag that's being a NASA mission. You can all get a pin, which is uh, commemorating the Trappist planetary system, which I'll talk about in a bit. I'm talking about investigations within our galaxy focusing on the formation of stars and planetary systems. I'll also give you a bit of a tutorial about infrared astronomy, and then Peter will pick up and talk about the galaxies, the distant universe, cosmology, and all the wonderful things we're learning about our distant <coughs> origins. On the right, you can see what are called the Great Observatories, which is a family of observatories that NASA started uh, uh, publicizing in around 1985. And they cover the entire electromagnetic spectrum, which is shown here, from the gamma rays at the extreme left to the infrared at the extreme right. And we now know that all parts of the spectrum are necessary to get a true understanding of the astrophysical universe, not to mention radio waves, neutrinos, and cosmic rays, and a few other things, gravitational waves now. Um, you can see that in the middle, in the spectrum, that most of the light in these spectral bands doesn't get to the Earth. It's blocked by the atmosphere, which is a good thing for us, but that's why a lot of this work is being done from space. Even in the infrared where Spitzer and JW operate, uh, the atmosphere is often quite uh, opaque or, or cloudy due to water vapor. And the other thing you see here is a temperature scale. Every object in the universe at any temperature radiates radiation, electromagnetic radiation, consistent with its temperature. The colder it gets, the longer the wavelength of the radiation. And you may have heard infrared radiation or infra light, infrared light being described as heat because we perceive the light from an infrared lamp as heat as it strikes our body. Spitzer is uh, exploring objects with temperatures between about a few thousand degrees, which is the coolest stars, and a few tens of degrees, which is material in the space between the stars and everything in between, as well as studying other objects which are also studied in other spectral bands. So let's get started. You might say, uh, how different do things look in the infrared? And here I have a picture of Rusty the dog in the infrared and in the visible. You can see he looks rather different in the two images. In the visible, what we're seeing is light from the room or the sun reflected from um, Rusty. But since Rusty's at a temperature of about 300 degrees Kelvin, like you and me, or 95 degrees Fahrenheit, whatever, uh, he radiates infrared radiation. And in the infrared picture on the left, what we're seeing is the radiation from Rusty. If we turn the lights off, we couldn't see Rusty in the visible, they look just the same in the infrared. And you can see that um, as a temperature scale, which is linked to the image of Rusty, at the places where his, um, where you're looking closer to his blood supply, closer to his heart, like his mouth and his eyes and the insides of his ears, he's hotter. Whereas in places where the um, uh, fur is thickest, he's coldest. That's all easily understood. And since Rusty is a proper dog, he has a cold nose. Now, if, if a uh, thing as simple as a dog looks that different in the visible and the infrared, you can imagine the things in the heavens do as well. So let me start by talking about the old, the cold, and the dirty, which is not the name of an unreleased Clint Eastwood movie, but is in fact uh, our slogan for the things we study uniquely in the infrared part of the spectrum. Um, on the left, you have an image of a, a deep image of a region of the sky taken at visible light, whereas on the right, when you add the infrared, you see this group of red objects. They're color-coded, uh, and red is the infrared radiation. 
uh, which is a distant group of galaxies called the cluster of galaxies, more than halfway across the universe. And we call that old because the light that we're seeing left these galaxies eight or 10 billion years ago to come to be detected by Spitzer. I should say that all the images, many of the images I show you will be in the infrared, similarly with Peter. They're all things you couldn't see with your eyes, but we have no shame about color coding them, generally in a way where the longest wavelength of the coolest material is red and the warmest material is blue. The reason we do that is you would not be very impressed if I showed you a series of ones and zeros. And besides that, the human eye can look at a scene uh, with many wavelengths of light represented and just intuitively figure out what's going on. And, the, and the, the coloration is a help and a, gu a guide to that. So that's the old light from distant objects shifted into the infrared by the cosmic redshift, which Peter will be talking about. Next comes the cold. This is an object which is the, uh, called the helix nebula. It's what's called the planetary nebula, which is a shell of gas ejected from a solar type star in the later stages of its life. On the left is a visible wavelength image, and on the right is an image from Spitzer, and that red uh, blob at the center of the image is a cloud of dust, which is uh, probably related to a planetary system that may have existed around this star before it exploded, and that material is so cold, it doesn't produce any light in the visible, but it's easily seen in the infrared because it's at a temperature of about 100 degrees, which puts it right in the wheelhouse for an infrared mission like Spitzer or JWST. <clears throat> I should say, by comparison, the sun, which is at a temperature of 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, is hot enough to radiate all of its light in the visible, where we can see it, not coincidentally. But um, <clears throat> a cloud like the one in this image, the red cloud, is seen only in the infrared because the material is so much cooler. And finally, we get to the dirty. This is a visible light image of a region called NGC 1333. And this is what you see. You see a lot of blank places there. This is what you see when you look in the infrared. Those blank places are filled with a kind of a zoo of objects, many of which we now know are young and forming stars. Let me just switch back and forth one more time. Visible light, the infrared light. And um, all these objects are too cold or too hidden by dust to be seen in visible light, but can readily be seen in the more penetrating infrared light. In other instances, uh, dust will absorb visible light and re-radiate it in the infrared, as was mentioned earlier. And the red color up on the left is due to, a, in the infrared image, a class of molecules, which are hydrocarbon molecules, and their spectrum, spectrum is light as a function of wavelength, which is a way of, uh, like a rainbow, but more finely divided, perhaps, of finding out what something is made of. And the cartoon, or the drawing on the upper right, is the spectrum of the emission from these hydrocarbon molecules, which happens to be bright at the wavelength around eight microns, where that image was that reddish image was taken. This, this image is a montage of images at different wavelengths taken by the IRAC instrument for which Peter, that's one of Spitzer's three instruments, for which Peter was the uh, uh, instrument scientist. So let's move ahead now, and, and we now understand that infrared radiation is heat radiation. It does unique things. So why can't we just do it from the ground? Well, the reason for that, apart from the crappy transmission of the atmosphere, is that everything on the ground is really warm and produces a lot of infrared radiation. So if you're trying to look at a distant star through a telescope which is warm and an atmosphere which is warm, you'll get swamped by the infrared radiation of these objects in the foreground and not be able to see a faint object uh, in space. And that's kind of illustrated here. This is a picture of the Palomar telescope. During the day, the dome is closed and the astronomers are asleep. And it opens up at night because the sky gets dark. On the right and around the corner there are different images of the sky as it would be seen from the Palomar Observatory. In daytime, 
Uh, the sky is bright in the visible part of the spectrum due to scattered sunlight, and it's bright in the infrared part of the spectrum because of the thermal radiation from the atmosphere and the telescope. When you go out at night, of course, the sun's gone down, and there's no scattered light from the atmosphere, and you can see very clearly in the visible the constellation Orion. But again, in the infrared, you're still swamped by this foreground radiation. Now, people, to be candid, have, have fought that in many ways, and there was a lot of important pioneering infrared work done from the ground. But only when you get into space can you see the heavens in their glory in the infrared. And that's shown in the lower left, which is the <coughs> visible light as seen from Palomar, and then the infrared view of Orion as seen by an early infrared satellite called IRAS. So if you want to work at night in the infrared, you go into space with a cold telescope. And that's what both Spitzer and JW have done. A little tutorial on Spitzer. Um, my model for Spitzer, if you're familiar with Shakespeare, is though she be but little, she is fierce. It's only an 85 centimeter telescope. Uh, we have large detector arrays, similar to what you have in your cell phone, so we can take panoramic pictures. Um, Spitzer, although it's only 85 centimeter, is more sensitive than a 10 meter telescope on the ground. And it was named for Princeton astrophysicist Lyman Spitzer. Uh, we launched in 2003. We just celebrated the 20th anniversary of the launch, and we retired in January. We were retired in January of 2020. The reason is shown here on the right, where that's a picture of the orbit of Spitzer as it would appear if you were sitting above the North Pole of the Earth. So you're on sitting on the Earth watching Spitzer go around the sun, watching the Earth go around the sun, and then Spitzer was launched from the Earth into an orbit not around the Earth, but around the sun. And the reason we wanted to do that is because the Earth is pretty hot, and it's a big source of infrared radiation and heat, and we wanted to be in a colder place, and so we went into deep space, and as we got further and further away with time, communication got more and more difficult, which is basically why we were retired in 2020. People or engineers are interested in more detail. We used in Spitzer not just, Spitzer, the telescope itself was cooled to a few degrees above absolute zero to totally omit, eliminate its infrared radiation. And we kept it at that temperature for 17 years, even though we ran out of liquid helium, by using what's called radiative cooling, where we cool by radiating uh, uh, energy in the space. And that technique was adopted by James Webb. So that's Spitzer in a nutshell. James Webb in another nutshell. It's about a six and a half meter diameter telescope, 50 times the collecting area of Spitzer. Uh, it is a very complex structure which unfolded flawlessly on orbit. We expect at least a 10 year mission it's a huge gain over previous missions, over Hubble and the visible and the near infrared, the shorter infrared wavelengths, and over Spitzer and the longer infrared wavelengths. It's an international mission with major contributions from the European Space Agency and the Canadian Space Agency, and the early results are spectacular. And James Webb is in an interesting orbit, which is now being adopted by most astronomical missions that can afford it, which is called an L2 orbit. So James Webb, the L2 uh, Lagrangian point, it's called, is a place in space uh, on the, behind the Earth relative to the sun. So here's the sun, here's the Earth, here's the L2 position, as you can see there. And that L2, uh, thing orbiting at L2 is stable uh, as, as the whole system goes around. So you can put a spacecraft there, and it will stay there. Maybe some station keeping has to be done more or less indefinitely. And so that's the, because of the fact that the Earth and the Sun are on the same side of the spacecraft, you never have to worry about the Earth getting in the way of your observations. You get great viewing of the sky. And that's a preferred place now for the astronomical observatories of the future, uh, starting with James Webb. Okay, so I'll start up talking about star formation and exoplanets. Uh, 
fact for you to remember is that stars are forming in our galaxy today. Not one a day, but a few a year. And uh, similarly, planetary systems, which we now know are very common around stars like the sun, are forming with equal frequency. This cartoon on the right shows that since schematically the steps under which a star forms. So you start with a cloud of interstellar material, material which is between the stars, and if it becomes massive enough, it will start to collapse under gravity. That's the top picture. As it collapses, because of what's called conservation of angular momentum, or spin, a disk tends to form, and that disk eventually will grow into a solar system. And at the same time, you've got these winds from the central uh, forming protostars. So in these pictures, the visible light is shown in blue, and the infrared light is shown in red. So for this stage, I'm talking about what's called class one. There's still a lot more infrared light than visible light, because the dust is absorbing the light from the star and re-radiating in the infrared. Those winds are important in the evolution of the young star, and I'll show you a very spectacular example of them in just a couple minutes. Then the class two is an object with about equal amounts of infrared and visible light. It's still surrounded by a significant disk of material, and that's the stage in which planetary system formation comes to fruition. And finally, the class three stage, the stars arrived on the main sequence like the sun is, but it might still have some infrared radiation due to dust orbiting the, the uh, star, which is related to comets and asteroids in a solar system around the star. So once you understand that Spitzer has the ability to sort objects into these groups, the figure on the left is different combinations of Spitzer data, uh, which highlight or represent the different stages in this evolution. And you can then look at a, um, a new region like this one, and you can see this is a region called W3. It doesn't matter what it's called. The, there's a bright star up there which is hollowing out the surrounding material. You can see that better on the left. And new stars are forming in places where the material in the cloud is strong enough to stand up to the, to the uh, light from the star, which otherwise is boiling it away. It's a little bit like how buttes and mesas and things like that form in the desert in Colorado. And the interesting thing here is we can classify the objects based on the Spitzer data, and we know that the objects which are colored yellow are in an earlier phase than the objects which are colored green in this schematic drawing. And that's because the, there's a wave of the erosion due to the light from the uh, central star there is gradually boiling this material away. So a few million years ago, the, the top which is here was up there, and the pressure of the material for, uh, the pressure of the light on the material led to stars forming there, which were left behind now that this wave of uh, destruction has propagated further into the crowd cloud, rather, and that's called triggered star formation. Um, Spitzer has the ability to study these young objects and the star and the disks around them and obtain spectra, which are shown here. If you look through the disk, as on the left, the upper left, you see the icy material, which makes up the outer regions of the disk. So you can see there that we're seeing material due to methyl alcohol, water ice, carbon dioxide and silicate grains, all of which are in this disk that we're looking at through, we're looking through the disk to see the star and the intervening material absorbs the light. If you've got a direct view of the disk, of the, of the system as shown in the lower left, you might see a gaseous material closer to the star orbiting in the disk. And that case, it's a great deal of water vapor, which is seen in this uh, forming star, which of course is very significant because water vapor or water is the uh, major building block of life as we know it. 
James Webb is doing much, much better, uh, looking much deeper and in more detail at these kinds of systems. On the right, you can see a spectrum of the ice absorption from a different object seen by James Webb, where you've got water ice, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and OCS all in the same spectrum. These are all ices that have formed on the grains in the cold material that uh, we're looking through. And on the left is a spectacular image of the winds. Remember I told you about the winds from the class one protostars. In this case, the wind is blown out and inflated a bubble. So to the lower left, you can see the bubble quite clearly. To the upper right, maybe not quite so clearly. And the star itself that's doing all this is hidden because we're looking at it through the disk. But we know it's there because of that uh, diffraction cross, which tells you there's a point source there. So this is an example of the kind of data that James Webb is, Webb is returning on the structure and on the composition of forming stars. And finally, in many cases, Spitzer and James Webb work together. Spitzer has laid out things on a larger scale, and James Webb can explore them in more detail. And that's illustrated here. This is a dramatization, a, a, not a dramatization, a realization using real Spitzer data and real James Webb data. So we're starting with a Spitzer image of a region called Rho Fiucus, maybe the size of, this image may be the size of the full moon, with lots of stuff going on. Well, again, all this stuff is in the infrared. And then we zoom in, and as we zoom in on this one bright region, we see what James Webb saw there, which is much, much greater detail and, and shows that the stars forming there in all their glory, but they needed Spitzer as a precursor to tell them where to point to make this observation. So that's so spectacular that I'll play it again. Whoops, I won't play it again. So they're, they're using O Spitzer data to uh, point with James Webb at Exactly, yeah. So Spitzer retired, but an important thing about these NASA observatories is that all the data is archived, and it's archived in an extremely user-friendly way. I mean, you don't have to be an ace astronomer to access it. In fact, the Spitzer data are archived on the Caltech campus, and, and the James Webb astronomers looked at that archive to find interesting things to pursue. So I'm going to switch gears now and talk for a few minutes about, about how are we doing for time here. Pardon? Okay. Talking about exoplanets, which are planets around other stars. And if there's one thing I want you to take away from this talk, it's that essentially all stars like the sun have one or more planets orbiting them. But as you can see, the planets can be hard to see. This is, a, what, this is the sun and the earth to physical scale, but not to uh, distance. Of course, earth is much for, for, farther than that from the sun but it's hard to see a planet in the, in the blinding light of the star. So many of the first detections of exoplanets were done by looking at the effect on the light from the star of the planet itself. And let me just concentrate on the upper right here. This is what's called transit photometry. So there's so many planets around, so many stars, that a number of these systems are edge on as we look at them. And we can see the planet move either in front of the star or behind the star. And that's illustrated here. So here you have a planet orbiting a star. We're looking at it. Let me go, let it go around once, and then I'll explain what's happening. <clears throat> so at this point, first of all, th th these planets are what's called tidally locked, like the moon is to the Earth. They're so close to the star that they always have one face looking at the star. And when, when that face is shown there in blue. So when the planet passes in front of the star, the light from the star decreases because some of the star is blocked by the planet, and we can see the light filtering through the planet's atmosphere. When the planet goes behind the star, and you can see in this part of the curve, as the planet turns, if it's hot enough to produce infrared radiation, you see more and more infrared radiation until it disappears behind the star. And the um, 
amount by which the light drops when it disappears tells you how much infrared radiation you're getting from the planet. That technique was used in a very compelling way in an early result from Spitzer, where this is actually the temperature distribution on the surface of a planet figured out by looking at this data in this light curve as, as each increment of the, of the um, planet surface came into view as it rotated towards us, you see more and more infrared light. This is a notional temperature map of the temperature of the surface of a planet which you can't even see. It's quite amazing that people are able to do this. And it's a testimony, of course, to Spitzer that uh, it technically was able to do so. And the interesting thing about this is that the, where the two arrows intersect is the center of the planet, and you might think that would be hottest, but in fact, the hottest region is a little off to one side, and we attribute that to winds, which are carrying the light of the star around the surface of the planet. So I'll skip over the next two charts, which just show how James Webb is determining the composition of planetary atmospheres, exoplanetary atmospheres, by using one or the other of these techniques, and get to our famous trip, TRAPPIST result. So this was Spitzer's most notable uh, result. It got us above the fold on the New York Times. It got us a Google Doodle, which is really the ultimate form of, uh, of uh, praise. And what it was on the left, Spitzer was able to observe this system called TRAPPIST-1, which was known from some Earth-based observations to have interesting and pulsing properties consecutively for 20 days. And as it did so, it saw a number of times when the light from the planet dropped, and these were attributed to a number of light from the star dropped due to different planets sequentially crossing in front of it. And when all of this was decoded, we found out that there are seven planets about the size of the Earth all transiting this faint red star, which is called Transit 1, TRAPPIST-1. Seven planets which are squeezed right in, nestling up to the star, much closer to that star than Mercury is to the sun, because this star is a pretty puny star. And if you look, if you look at this in more detail, you can see that water vapor might be in liquid form on the two or three planets in the middle. Uh, and this is a prime target for the study with James Webb to see if we can find uh, biologically interesting molecules or even atmospheres on these planets. Um, this, these are the uh, planetary observations planned for JW before launch. What's plotted is the mass of the planet versus the temperature. So the Earth is right in this region here. One mass of the Earth, about 300 degrees. And planets in that region of this chart are of particular interest, most of which are, in fact, planets orbiting the Strapis star. So here is the uh, observation from James Webb of the thermal emission from one of these planets, which has about the size and the temperature of Venus. So we're, we're hoping that it would have an atmosphere like Venus, in which case this curve When it was detected, it was much hotter than expected from that model because there was no atmosphere to block the light from coming to us. And this led to the somewhat disappointing conclusion that there's not much of an atmosphere at all around this particular star. On the other hand, bear in mind what was done here. We're actually measuring the radiation from a planet about the size of the Earth at about the temperature of the Earth, but about 40 light years away. And that's quite amazing that James Webb is able to do that, and it foreshadows what we're going to see in the future. Whoops, I seem to go in the wrong direction. Sorry. One last comment. Even though there are literally thousands of exoplanets known now, in this plot, which plots the orbital period, which is directly observable, when you study an exoplanet versus the apparent mass of the planet, you can see all those black dots. This is a little out of date, but its story still is the same. 
All those black dots are exoplanets that have been discovered. And you can see that none of the planets in our solar system, which is what shown there in, in the round circles, Neptune, Uranus, Saturn, etc., basically none of those would have been detected around a star like the sun in the, in the orbits they have in our solar system with the existing data sets. So we still have an awful lot to do to understand how our solar system fits in with the exoplanet discoveries. Speaking of our solar system, and I'm winding to the end here, this is a comet called Hale-Bopp. We study objects in our solar system and understand how they compare with what's going on in the exoplanetary systems. And, and they're very similar in many interesting ways. In this case, the uh, spectrum of the radiation from comet Hale-Bopp, as seen by the European ISO spacecraft, is very similar to that of one of the exoplanet systems studied by Spitzer. So this comparative exoplanet work is going to be important. And finally, I'll turn this over to Peter, who will tell us about galaxies. Thanks, Mike. I'm going to try and walk around with this a little bit. Um, so. So thanks. So so far, we've been dabbling around in our own neighborhood, um, sort of 40, 50 light years away, looking at um, planets around other stars, which are, I think, probably the subject in astronomy that is of greatest interest to the average person. I you know I used to start conversations when I would be flying on airplanes, which I try to avoid doing now, uh, and they usually wanted to know if I thought there was life in the universe and. We are, we're getting to the point now where our technology and our brains are, are reaching the, the level where we can start to answer that in a very meaningful way. Mike emphasized the point that we now know, for you know, our generation is really the first to know that planets around other stars are common. We know that for a fact now. We didn't know that when I was a kid. Um, and I expect my kids probably will know about life beyond the Earth. Um, which, which I expect there is, and I hope there's still life on Earth by that time. Anyway, we're going to now take a big leap outwards to um, beyond our own galaxy. Um, Mike showed a, a mosaic of the center of our galaxy that was kind of that red picture when he, when he said he's talking about star, star formation and exoplanets. That was about the central few thousand light years of our own Milky Way. Um, this is a, a galaxy called um, Messier 81, M81 which is relatively nearby, but relatively nearby for a galaxy means not 30 light years, but 30 million light years. So we've just taken a big step out. Um, we'll take another step out in, in a few moments. But um, so this is a spiral galaxy. And uh, there, the, you see the spiral arms. You can see the individual bright star forming regions there. Um, our Milky Way doesn't look horribly different than this. Um, but we are, because we're in an arm of our galaxy, we're looking at it edge on. And so if you get out into the dark sky, not here, probably not even with Reggie's help, um, but you know, if you go out um, north of town or out into a dark sky, you'll see the Milky Way high overhead um, this time of year. And it's definitely worth, worth a look. Um, so this whole disk here is maybe 50,000, 100,000 light years across, just to give you an idea how big we're talking about now. And it's 30 million light years away. And what we're looking at is this particular galaxy as seen across Spitzer's wavelength range, which runs from uh, three and a half, 3.6 microns there on the lower left. That's shown in blue because we're showing the, the shortest, hottest wavelengths in blue out to the longest Spitzer wavelengths, 160 microns. And that's... Uh, just to give you a feel for this, this is, these are wavelengths that are anywhere from about um, five times uh, longer uh, or redder than the reddest light that our eyes see out to a few hundred times uh, redder than the, re the um, reddest light our eyes can see, or correspondingly from f objects that are five times cooler than the sun to a few hundred times cooler than the sun in terms of the temperature, as Mike mentioned. OK, uh, and yeah, I guess I should mention that uh, Spitzer is rewriting the textbooks, as you can see from the cover of that astronomy textbook in the lower left. Um, OK, so that was a, a, a nearby galaxy as seen by Spitzer. So where does that light really come from? 
This is another spectrum, and I'm showing relative brightness on the, on the vertical axis here and, and the wavelength. You can see the gray band is, is the part, or the wavelengths that Spitzer covers. Um, and you can see the, the light from a, a typical galaxy there has two big bumps, one on the left around one micron and one on the right more like 100 microns. The one on the left comes from uh, mature stars, stars that are actually uh, cooler than the sun. Um, and stars like that are actually where most of the mass in a galaxy resides. And so by measuring how much light there is in that bump around a micron, you get an idea of how, how, what the mass in stars is of a galaxy. The bump on the right and the squiggles in the middle um, tell us about the star formation in that galaxy. The squiggles in the middle are very much the same squiggles that Mike showed in that cartoon uh, early on where he was talking about the hydrocarbons. These are hydrocarbon features that are, um, these are um, basically like uh, smoke particles that are being excited by, uh, by uh, hot light from young stars. Uh, that light from the young stars often doesn't get out because where there's smoke, there's dust. Um, the dust is what's making the peak, this big peak on the right, and that's heating up from, from, the young, from the hot light from the stars. It's blocking the visible light, but it's warming up and radiating in the infrared. And so we get from, from these features uh, on the right here, uh, the squiggles and the, and the dust bump, we get an idea of how much hot dust, relatively hot dust, and hot to astronomers means like maybe 50 Kelvin, you know, minus 200 degrees Celsius, minus 300 some Fahrenheit. So hot is a relative term here, but with the universe having an average temperature of three degrees above absolute zero, um, 50 or 100 degrees above absolute zero is, 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 tells you that there's something going on. Okay, so that's where the light comes from these, in these galaxies, and, and Spitzer is able to um, use these features to assess the, the mass of stars in, in galaxies and the dust, dusty star formation rate in galaxies, and where stars are forming is typically a dusty place. So that's a very important measure to have. Okay, so here is uh, a neighbor of that first galaxy I showed, uh, M81. This one's called M82, also about 30 million light years away. The blue light here is coming from that first bump, it's telling us about the stars, the older stars in that galaxy, mature stars. And the red light is coming from those hydrocarbons. And it, it's this, this is um, smoke particles, again, uh, that are being blasted out in a burst of star formation. This is a star starburst galaxy, and we understand that this starburst in M82 was caused by it sweeping really close by uh, M81, the, the, the first galaxy that I showed. Um, this is a picture of another fairly nearby galaxy. Again, all of these are sort of 30, 40 million light years away. This one's called the Sombrero um, Invisible Light. You mostly just see the hat part on top and the brim. Um, but in the infrared, all of the, the blue light here uh, comes through um, without being blocked by any of the dust, that, that's, those are the older stars, and you've got a big fuzzy elliptical galaxy, we call these sort of round fuzzy galaxies elliptical galaxies, and then in red in those hydrocarbons again, we've got kind of a, a more spirally galaxy, and it's almost like you have two different galaxies that are happily cohabitating. Uh, so you get a, real, a really different view of, of uh, the universe when you, when you look in the infrared. Uh, this is a, a picture uh, in the visible and the infrared from Hubble on the left, and the very exact same, the exact same region, carefully matched, um, seen by James Webb uh, on the right. And it's just, it's stunningly different to me. Um, I kind of like to think of, of this sort of structure, which you, which seems like you often see in, in infrared pictures, is it's kind of like the bones of the galaxy, the skeleton of the galaxy, but what, what you're really seeing is, is emission from dust here. Uh, okay, let me skip ahead here because I don't want to, right, yeah, we're going to, now we're going to take, that was millions of light years, now we're going to get into billions of light years. Okay, so this is that same spectrum I showed before with the bump around one micron and a hundred microns from mature stars and from warm dust. Um, now, as Mike mentioned, uh, there's this cosmological redshift effect. The universe is expanding, and as it expands, the light in the universe also expands. And so 
when the universe has grown by a factor of two in size, the light that, uh, that existed at the, at the time, at the start time, uh, will, will also have doubled in size. And so light from a galaxy that is far enough away that the universe has, ex has doubled in size, that light will also have doubled in size. It'll be 100% longer in wavelength. It, and that's called a redshift of one. What I've shown here is a redshift of two, where it's 200%, the universe is 200% bigger, the light is 200% bigger or, or three times as big. And that pushes these, uh, that black line into the red line, which is moving to the right towards longer wavelengths. And it's a little hard to see the gray Spitzer band here, but um, you can see that peak from the, the old stars that tells us the stellar mass is pushing into the Spitzer band there. And so if you want to see the distant stars in the universe, you really, really need to get out into the infrared. And that's, Spitzer is excellent at that, and James Webb is, is way better. In fact, that was a huge part of the motivation for James Webb. Um, and, and we are also able to, um, to measure the, this, uh, the hydrocarbon features and the dust bump out to, well, they're starting to leave at about a redshift of two. So um, I guess, yeah, the other point I want to make here is that you can see on the left, the light is really dropping very rapidly as we move towards shorter wavelengths. And as we look further and further away and that light expands in wavelengths, that cliff is moving across the optical wavelength region here. And so these galaxies start to become completely invisible, invisible light, <laughs> literally invisible. And so you really, you really do need to go to the infrared just to, to see them at all. Uh, yeah, and I did, I, I've already made this point that we were able to follow with Spitzer the dusty star formation out to a redshift of two or so. A redshift of two corresponds to a time when the universe was uh, just a few billion years old, about 10 billion years ago. And, uh, and this bump from the, the older stars that is telling us about how the mass of stars that were there, uh, we can follow that out all the way to a redshift of seven or more, qu quite close to the Big Bang. Um, okay, so uh, here's that picture again from Mike of this cluster of galaxies seen. This is a cluster of galaxies 8 billion years ago, 8 billion light years away, a redshift of 1.24, so 124% expansion factor. Um, can anybody see the cluster of galaxies here? Mm, I actually can, be, but I know where to look. Um, so, you know, if you bring in the Spitzer image, they just jump right out at you. And to really emphasize that point, this image on the left took about an hour with a pretty beefy telescope, a 150 inch uh, diameter telescope, whereas this image on the right took 90 seconds with the Spitzer telescope, which is you know, about this big, about less than a meter in diameter. Uh, yeah, I guess it's 30, 32 inches, I think. Hula hoop size. Um, okay, so, so uh, that tells you that uh, infrared is, uh, space infrared is what you need if you, want, if you want to see these distant galaxies. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the history of the universe, which Spitzer has done uh, a really major job of, of helping us understand. And so this is the history of the universe in one slide. 13.7 uh, billion years ago, uh, the, everything was in the same place, and there was this incredible expansion, the Big Bang. The universe was hot. Uh, and dense, and it expanded very rapidly. Um, eventually, after almost 400,000 years, it cooled to the point where um, atoms could, could become neutral. Uh, protons and electrons could stick together and make hydrogen. And that's, that's, you see that marked at the top there. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, as I said, as, and Mike has said, the light is expanding along with the universe, OK? And so I've, I've got a scale bar here, which shows two things. It shows redshift on the top, and it shows time since the Big Bang on the bottom. OK, so here we, on today, we're, we're at redshift zero. The universe is the size that it is today, so there, it's not bigger or smaller. It's just the size it is. Um, it was 10% smaller here at a redshift of 1. It was half the size, I'm sorry, redshift of 0.1, half the size at a redshift of 1, a third the size at a redshift of 2, 200% smaller. 
six times, uh, 600% smaller, one sentence the size at redshift six, and so on. And then to get back to this time when hydrogen was forming, we have to go all the way back to a redshift of 1,000. The universe was 1,000 times more compact at that time. In terms of time, uh, we have to look back actually over a billion years even, even to get a 10% expansion of the universe. Um, by the time we get to a redshift of one, which is similar to what I was showing with that cluster of galaxies, we're looking back six billion years, I'm sorry, 13.7 uh, minus six years, so 7.7 .7 billion years back. So I said that cluster of galaxies is about eight billion light years away. It's taken eight billion years for the light to expand uh, by a redshift factor of 1.24. So what this means is that by measuring the redshift, we can measure the distant past. This is, again, the old point that Mike was making at the, at the start, and, and George was making as well in his introduction. Um, right. OK, I think I've beat that one to death enough. So let me show you a, a somewhat deeper picture now than, than that hour with the 150-inch telescope. This is a, prior to James Webb, this was about the deepest image that was available, the Hubble Deep Field. Um, and uh, it was interesting, but it was invisible light, and people really wanted to see the most distant galaxies, which, as I've mentioned, um, disappear from visible light. So they started working as hard as they could with infrared observations. And this is about, I think, 11 nights with the Keck telescope, which is about the biggest optical telescope, biggest telescope on the ground. Um, and so that, that's a really a huge investment of time. There's not a lot to see there. Um, and then here is the Spitzer view. This is uh, about a day of exposure with, with Spitzer. And I guess I should have said the Hubble observation was about 10 days, just, just for comparison. And, and Spitzer was able to see lots and lots of stuff here across its whole wavelength range. And observations like this and from other telescopes allowed us to measure um, that dusty star formation out to very substantial redshifts, out to redshifts of two, in the case of Spitzer, a bit more. And then another infrared telescope called Herschel allowed us to push out to redshifts of, of four or so. And, and what, when you look at this, I should explain what, what we're looking at here. We're looking at a plot of star formation. We're looking at the average star formation rate per uh, uh, unit volume in the universe at each of these redshifts. And so on the left there at redshift zero, that's the average star formation rate in the universe today. It's a number like 0 0.015. If we go back to redshift of two, we see that it's not 0 0.015, it's about 0.15. It's about 10 times higher. So a redshift of two, which is about 10 billion years ago, the average star formation rate in the universe was 10 times higher than it is today. We, we often call this cosmic high noon. And what's even more interesting is that as you go back even further, you start to see the star formation fall again. In a way, you have to expect that because if you go all the way back to the Big Bang, there were no stars, so they had to form sometime, and it seems like that formation rate was ramping up. This part of the curve is not entirely um, without controversy. But uh, if we look at the, at the next plot here, we see something really interesting. I guess I should have said that that black line there is a, is a mathematical fit to these data points. Um, here now, we're looking at the other measure of galaxies I've been emphasizing. And this is the mass of stars that have formed in galaxies, again, as a function of redshift. Okay, um, And if you think about it, when you form stars, you've got more massive stars. And so as you keep forming more and more stars, you're going to have more and more massive stars. And so even though that star formation rate is going up and down, um, today we form the most stars that, that we can. And so the, the total uh, amount of stellar mass there over on the left is at its peak. Okay, And then as we go back, it starts to fall off, and then as, as as we fall, as we cross that, that peak at redshift two in the star formation rate, it starts to fall really fast. Now this black line is not a fit to this data. And this, this to me is the most amazing thing perhaps that Spitzer has done in terms of extragalactic um, 
uh, measurements. Um, because that black line is the same black line as this one, just converted into, well, how much mass of stars would we have if we formed that many stars? What would the, what would the stellar mass be? And that's that same line, and so, but it's a different measurement. The measurement in the other plot is, what is the star formation rate? The measurement here is, what is the mass of stars? So measurement in the other um, plot is from that, that 100 micron peak, the dusty star formation. The measurement here is from that one micron peak, the stellar mass. And the fact that those two agree actually makes you think, well, maybe astronomers have some idea what they're talking about. So. I, I was astonished. OK, I, um, we're, we're starting to run a little long here. And I don't want to cut too much into your uh, Reggie Wilkins time. But um, so, so we're, we're coming to, to the end. But um, I want to talk about the most distant galaxies, because we were only showing up to about a redshift of seven or eight. Um, but there was actually a more distant galaxy known until um, this year, and that was called GNZ11, um, which meant it had an estimated redshift of 11. Um, and that is so far back that we're looking at the universe when it was only 3% of its current age. So really, really in the infancy of, of the universe. Um, the redshift is so big that it's pushed the light way, way out into the infrared. And you can't even see it uh, until you get into a reasonably long infrared wavelength. So here's the visible range of wavelengths that we can see with our eye. Um, all these arrows pointing down means nothing to be seen there. Move along. Uh, it's, it's not until you get to 1.4 microns, well into the infrared, that you start to see maybe something. You know, there's just a faint smudge there, right? Um, and then at 1.6 microns, we get a reasonably sig significant Detection. And then when we get out to the Spitzer <coughs> range, four and a half microns, well, there's no question. There's something there. And that's this point here. And now, but because of the redshift, we're just getting into what started off as blue light. But that redshift of 11 has pushed it way, way out into the infrared. OK, well, this is suggestive of a redshift of 11. But astronomers want spectra. We don't just want these points that jump up like that. Um, so. Uh, with Hubble, um, they spent a day and a half trying to get a spectrum of this galaxy. And that's the result. It's not that impressive, but it's consistent with a redshift of 11. In fact, the best estimate was a redshift of 11.09. And then this year, James Webb took a spectrum, a several hour spectrum, and that's shown here. And there's really no question about the redshift for this object. So, you know, it almost looks fake. The, the way the light drops there on the left over here. Um, but that's, that's that edge in light that um, gets pushed into the infrared. And, and that's, that's the signature that astronomers uh, use to identify very distant galaxies. So no light at all gets through at the shortest wavelengths. And then it just switches on as uh, hydrogen starts to let it through. Um, and then we see all of these emission features, oxygen and neon and magnesium and carbon. Um, there's really zero doubt that this is not a redshift of maybe 11 or 11.09. No, this is a redshift 10.6034 galaxy. Um, and it's actually surprisingly bright. Um, it only took James Webb a few hours to get this spectrum. Um, and we actually, we, uh, we now know of, of more galaxies. I'll come to that in one second. But I did want to just show a, a deep image from James Webb. Uh, to complement the the one from Hubble that we showed before, this is this was the first deep image that James Webb released um, last summer, about a year ago. Um, it's of a galaxy cluster that's much closer than the one I showed before. This is only about five billion light years away. Um, it's a very massive cluster, and it actually it's, it, the mass of this cluster bends the light of objects behind it. It bends and magnifies and distorts background galaxies, and that's why. You see all these funny looking arc shapes that are centered around the center of this galaxy cluster. So this is, this is a galaxy in the cluster about 5 billion light years away. And all these reddish arcs are much, much further away. And they're red because they've had, they have bigger red shifts. And so their light has been pushed further in the infrared. And here is a, uh, a zoom in of that square part of it. And you can see the really weird distortions, but also magnifications that you get from this. 
And that magnification, which can be a factor of 10 and sometimes even more, allows um, James Webb to see even further back, um, to see things that are fainter than it could otherwise see because of that magnification. So uh, e even closer to the Big Bang. So uh, as I said, uh, the Goods North Z11 is now confirmed. All these filled red dots are definite. Um, we, we have no question that they're at the distances that are shown, at the redshifts that are shown. Uh, but it's, it's up pretty high in brightness. It's unusually bright. And there are other things that seem to be about that bright and aren't very much lower redshift. There are also uh, five galaxies that have even bigger redshifts that James Webb has now found. Um, and there's, there's some head scratching going on, to be fair, about, well, gosh, there seem to be an awful lot of these very bright galaxies a few per when the universe was just a few percent of its current age. How, how do they get so big so fast? It doesn't, doesn't really fit with our current understanding. And so, well, maybe we were just lucky. Um, we probably just need to be patient, look a little bit more broadly. Um, so stay tuned for more on this. Um, so we are now, uh, after a somewhat exhausting tour of the universe, we're, we're uh, back close to the Big Bang with Spitzer and James Webb. Spitzer brought us very close to the first light in the universe, and James Webb is bringing us even closer. And I'd like to close with this, uh, this excerpt from T.S. Eliot. What we call the beginning is often the end. We shall not cease from ex exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Thanks. Um, I, I imagine there are some questions here, and uh, but I also want to remind you that Reggie Wilkins is outside with his telescope. So uh, um, happy that Mike and I are happy to answer questions for. So the question is whether we can someday see solar system analogs with the James Webb. Not with the James Webb, because um, it, it doesn't have the right instrumentation. It has a sensitivity, perhaps, but you have to have a sophisticated instrument to block, to deal with the light from the star in order to see such a faint planet next to it. But there is another mission coming up called the Habitable Worlds Observer, which may be uh, launching in 2040-something which is, has its, one of its prime objectives is, in fact, to look around all the stars close to the sun for uh, terrestrial-type components. And it has a specialized instrument which will make that uh, feasible. Yeah. Oh, but, uh, so when you talk about space test, what should I be imagining? Dust, dust, or really big stuff? <laughs> what was the question? Uh, uh, dust. So uh, maybe both of us should answer that. Um, I, I tend to think of um, the dust, you know, when, when we're talking about the, the dusty star formation uh, and the, the debris disks where we're seeing the emission from dust uh, in, the, in the early phases of, of uh, star formation and, and planet uh, solar system formation, I, I tend to think of that as getting as small as smoke particles, but then uh, in, in solar systems, there's a lot that happens, and Mike should probably say a little bit more about that. I mean, so you, it's, a, it's a complicated process, but it gets as small as smoke particles and, and uh, can be much, much bigger. Yeah, in, in, a, in a solar system, what happens in a forming solar system is that the material comes together in this disk and the dust particles tend to stick together and agglomerate. And they build up the uh, embryos, if you like, from which uh, planets uh, eventually might emerge. So they're like space, uh, space uh, dust planets. Yes, <laughs> dust, dust bunnies, yeah. And, and, and they're ubiquitous. The dust, the, the universe is 75% uh, uh, hydrogen. 23% helium, and 2% everything else. And the dust particles is where a lot of that everything else ends up. Uh, so I think Michael you had a, a graphic where there's that exoplanet going around its star, but it looked like it was fixed, like it's not rotating on an axis like... It's 
Yeah, the question is why is what's going on with that exoplanet anyhow? And we believe that a planet which is that close to a star is going to be uh, gravitationally locked just like the moon is to the Earth. So we only see one side of the Earth as the moon goes around it. Here, the blue, which is the heated side of the star of the planet, is always going to be the same as the planet goes around the star. It, 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 yeah, it's just because it's close to the star, and the tidal the tidal forces of the star will distort it in such a way that it's most comfortable not rotating itself. Okay, does that make sense? Just like you, we never see the dark side of the moon. The reason we have a dark side is because it's the other side that we see all the time. Because the gravity of the Earth locks the moon tidally. The similar way, the gravity of that star will lock that planet tidally. And so there's only one side that's constantly illuminated. Okay, hope that helps. Yeah, uh, the question is whether by the end of its lifetime, the main advance we're expecting from James Webb will be that it will have mapped out more objects. And I, I think that's probably too pessimistic. Um, Mike, maybe you want to say a little bit about exoplanets and Spitzer in that regard. Yeah, there are two points there, of course. One is that the exoplanet work, which was Spitzer's greatest hit, wasn't even envisioned while we were designing, building, and launching Spitzer. By the time we launched, we knew there were exoplanets, but exoplanets were only discovered in 1996. And it's been a revolution and a flood of data or a plethora of planets since then. So one possibility is that, a real possibility, James Webb will discover some totally unexpected phenomenon, which would, would, be, would add to its um, scientific uh, productivity. And the other is that I think the right way to think of James Webb in comparison to Spitzer is as an instrument that can study in detail individual objects or phenomena that have been identified as being of interest from Hubble and Spitzer. So it's not re really a question of, of adding more scalps, if you'd like, to the belt of astronomers. It's more a question of, of uh, well, that's a horrible analogy, so I won't go anywhere with it. But it's more a question of studying in, in more detail the physical processes, evolutionary composition, and so forth in the uh, objects which are hitherto have really been inaccessible for those kinds of studies. Yeah, I can give one specific example of uh, a very high priority project for, for James Webb, which is to understand how we got from this phase when we had just neutral hydrogen I'm not sure if that's the building or okay ah uh, okay um, to get from the state when neutral hydrogen formed at, at a redshift of thousand to the state of the universe today and actually going back to redshift of six but at redshift of a six neutral hydrogen has all been ionized again so today all the hydrogen in the universe is once again electrons and protons flying around there's very little neutral hydrogen in the universe today and so that process where we went from neutral hydrogen back to ionized hydrogen is called reionization and understanding what caused that process how it happened that's a major goal it's a, basically a phase change in the universe and that's a major goal for James Webb to understand So you're, you're asking about artificial intelligence? Yeah, so, so um, you know, the, in, in the past 10 years, relatively little. In the past year or two, it's definitely starting to have an impact. Um, I, will, I will say that, uh, you know, the volumes of data that we're getting with the big, the Spitzer had big arrays compared to what telescopes had before, but the newer telescopes have even bigger arrays. Uh, and so there's just, you know, it used to be that a megabyte was a lot of data, it used to be then a gigabyte, then a terabyte, but now we're talking about petabytes. I mean, just too much data for people really to, to analyze ef effectively. And so uh, even to look at, and so one of the things that's starting to happen is we're saying, well, gosh, you know, these are interesting kind of things in this 
measly one terabyte of data, look at this petabyte of data and tell me if you find more things like it. And um, so that's an example. So um, with that kind of technique, we've actually found some stars near the sun, cool, cool stars near the sun called brown dwarfs that we didn't know about before. Um, and, I, and I think that's just the tip of the iceberg. I think, I think there, there's a, a, a very large um, opportunity there. Um, and the, the scary thing to me is, you know, I'm, I'm on a paper where we, we talk about some of these nearby brown dwarves that we found with this machine learning, we call it. Um, but we don't quite know <laughs> how the machine did it. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit scary. <laughs> Last question. Uh, we're going to be glad to take your conversations. What is there right now? About five or six thousand exoplanets? Yeah, I was about five thousand identified exoplanets. Sorry, five five thousand identified exoplanets. Okay. Well, thank you all very very much. It's really wonderful to be here.